Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To. Another day, another Thermaltake power supply. Today we're going to take a look at the Thermaltake Tough Power GF A3 1050 watt ATX 3.0 PCI Express Gen 5 ready power supply with a gold rating and a whole host of cool features. On today's video, we go through, do a little bit of a kind of tear down, see what we actually get inside the packaging, talk about some of the specifications, pros, cons, etc. discuss pricing, and see if this is going to be suitable for your next build, especially if your build is going to be a somewhat white themed build, hence the snow version of the power supplies. Now, Thermaltake have been really good recently. They've got an absolute ton of power supplies available in various different price ranges, capacities, style of cabling and also in colors as well so if you want something for your pc there's a pretty strong chance that thermal take gonna have something for you somewhere and i will be putting links in the video description for this particular model and also other models which are available in both the gf a3 range and the gf3 range now i should say straight away people will keep on asking the same question and uh, we should reiterate it they say, Mike, what is the difference between the GF range and the GF A3 range? Well, it's actually relatively straightforward. Essentially, the GF A3 range is a slightly cut down version designed to hit a slightly lower price point in order for Thermaltake to be competitive in the market and obviously compete against their peers. So what they've done is made a few subtle changes to make this power supply a little bit cheaper to produce, but still produce the excellent quality that we're used to from Thermaltake products and still comply with ATX 3.0 standards and also PCI Express Gen 5 connection standards. So you can be sure this is gonna be suitable for your PC, no matter what you're throwing at it. So some of the things they've done in terms of the capacitors, so this still has 105C capacitors throughout, although it's only now the main capacitor which is a high spec Japanese one. The other ones potentially may be Japanese still, but they may not be from a specific factory. So there is that to look into it. And with that, you do get slightly lesser response on the ripple. So we're now looking at 50 millivolt ripple rather than 30. And when it comes down to the voltage regulation, not quite as tight on the GF A3 range. So we're looking at somewhere around about 5% plus or minus, whereas the GF3 range, we're looking at somewhere around 3%. So still extremely tight, but not as tight as it could be. And with that, you do get these a little bit cheaper. Now also you get them a little bit smaller as well. So these actually physically are smaller. They come with a 120 mil fluid dynamic bearing fan rather than the 130 or 135 or 140 mil fans in some of the other models in the range but you still get some pretty decent specs out of these in terms of wattages they don't go quite as high up to the 1650s etc but there should be again like i said pretty much something for everyone something else which has changed which i actually haven't seen or noticed any real difference at all is the way the smart zero fan works so these do support smart zero fan technology which you have the option of either turning it on or off with the gf3 range normally it kicks in somewhere around about the 30 percent mark whereas these are anywhere between 30 to 40. realistically i've not noticed any difference and to be honest with you in use you probably won't either now obviously all those changes do make a little bit of a difference but where they do actually make a difference for most of you watching this is going to be in your wallet so this does come in at a cheaper price point now it's really hard to gauge exactly how much cheaper or how much you're going to save obviously due to exchange rates and potential offers on so you're looking at somewhere realistically between 20 to 30 pounds saving overall between the gf a3 and the gf3 range but again that does change a little bit depending on what offers are available, special premiums, etc., etc. You should find yourself saving a little bit of money. So anyway, with all that out of the way, let's get into the unboxing and see what it's all about. So packaging wise, pretty much exactly the same deal from what you expect from Thermaltake. So it's got all the specs laid out there. So this is a gold rated power supply as stated, 1050 watts. Again, other versions are available. I think it starts at about 750 watts and goes up to maybe 1200 watts. That may change, so depending when you're watching this, check out the links in the video description, you'll see exactly what models are available. This is a fully modular power supply as well, very similar to the GF3 in that regard. And in fact, the cabling is pretty much identical from the one that you've possibly seen already, the 1200 watt from the GF3. And in fact, you may find some of the B-roll actually is from that review, because I thought, well, I've already done it, so why do it again? Because essentially it's exactly the same, but we will go through the cabling in detail anyway, so don't worry about that. Obviously, again, PCI Express Gen 5 compatible. So if you are considering getting yourself a 4060, 4070, 4080, 4090, or whatever else comes out from NVIDIA, and it's using that 16-pin power plug, you can rest assured this is going to be absolutely fine, and the plug is rated up to 600 watts. Again, 
as per usual with ATX 3.0 and also the new PCR Express Gen 5 standards, we are looking at power excursions, which is where these new power supplies kind of make up some of their costing. They do have extra technology in them that we don't see in ATX power supplies or ATX 2.0. So this will do up to a two times excursion for the general power supply itself, the motherboard, etc. When it comes to the GPU, anywhere up to three times the excursion. So that is for those transient spikes where your graphics card suddenly demands an absolute ton of power for a brief millisecond and then goes back to normal. This is gonna cope with that absolutely fine. So we've already mentioned ATX 3.0. We understand what that is all about. You've got the smart zero fan. So again, if you want it to be pretty much silent, you can turn that on and it will only kick in at a certain kind of temperature or usage on the power supply or you can just leave it on altogether. I have found actually with the 120 mil fans in these, the FDB fluid dynamic bearing fans are actually quite good. Some people found in early iterations of these that there's a little bit of a weird noise to them in some instances, but this one that I've tested is absolutely fine and is basically silent. And again, as we said earlier, the main Japanese capacitor, so the main capacitor, which is the one which pretty much most of you are gonna rely on, is a Japanese 105C. Hopefully you're seeing some exploded shots of this from their website so you can see what the capacitors are. And again, exactly the same as the GF3, the GFA3 also comes with a 10-year warranty. On the back of the box goes into some more specifications, again, the features, and also you can see there the certified efficiency. Again, users in Europe and also in the UK do get a slightly better efficiency due to our 230 volt power supply. But don't worry, even if you're in the US and you're on 110, 115, you're still going to get that gold rating. Also, it says about the fan there, it's very difficult to actually demonstrate it, especially when it's in a PC, but you get an idea there of the actual stepping there. So it kicks in around about 30% up to a static level and then gradually rises as the requirement on the power supply rises also. When it comes to the 12 volt rail on here, you have got a single 12 volt rail, which will give out 87.5 amps which if you times that by 12 gives you your 1050 watts. Also, you've got an additional 100 watts available on the 3.3 and also the 5 volt rails. So you could argue this is kind of like a 1200 watt power supply, but thermal take being a genuine, they've actually marked those separately. So they haven't combined it as we see with some other manufacturers. Right, so let's take a look at the power supply. And as per usual with thermal tape, you do get the nice sleeve in there as well. So in terms of presentation, it's all good. You also get the bag included with a mains power cable, which is gonna be suitable for your particular region. In this instance, we've got a three pin UK plug. Also, there's a bunch of cable ties and four screws to attach the power supply into your PC case. Now the power supply itself, like we said, is slightly smaller. Put the dimensions on the screen for you now, but this is basically 150 by 140 and the standard dimensions otherwise. So it's quite a compact unit, not a lot of depth there. So if you are maybe considering going into a slightly smaller case and you are somewhat concerned of actually being able to fit it in with the modular cables, etc., then this should be absolutely brilliant. And obviously taking up less room means it's a little bit easier to install. You have got the normal ventilation. So you've got the... Uh, elongated ovals there on the bottom, thermal take logo. On the sides, a little bit more ventilation as well. And that is on both sides. As per usual, they've actually put the label on upside down on one side. So if you're mounting it fan up or whether you're mounting it fan down, you'll find that the logo on the side looks as it should do. So you can show off your branding if you wish to, or obviously cover it up if you don't want to. On the top, you've got the ratings on there again, as we've looked at already on the box. So 1050 watt, 10 year guarantee. 87.5 amps on that 12 volt rail. When it comes to connectivity or connecting it to your main supply, usual deal. So you've got the IEC, which is covered up by the uh, smart sticker, which basically explains what the switch does. So whether it's on or off in the on position, smart mode is enabled. So the fan will only power up when there is a significant draw on the power supply or temperatures get to a point where it needs to cool itself down. If you leave it in the off position, then the fan will stay on continually. And again, it will go through that gradual ramp up as the temperature or the demand requires. Now on the business end, being this is a fully modular power supply, as we've already discussed, you've got all your connections there laid out quite nicely. And this is gonna be great. So if you're with a NVIDIA graphics card and you're using that 16 pin connection, then you've got a dedicated port for that there. No issues whatsoever. And a lot of people also say, but Mike, I'm gonna be using the AMD graphics card or some custom NVIDIA card, which doesn't necessarily have that connector. What do I do? Don't worry, you've got three additional connections there for either CPU, EPS, or for PCI Express 
your traditional six plus two or eight pin connections. So you've got those there. There's actually two for the CPU on the bottom and three for the GPU. So even if you've got a motherboard which needs two EPS connections in the top and you've got a graphics card that needs three connections, no worries at all. Now, obviously being modular, you don't have to worry about connecting cables if you don't need them. If you've just got a single eight pin GPU, just plug in one cable, absolutely fine. All the other stuff there, pretty much standard deal. So we've got peripheral and SATA connections and obviously you've got your 24 pin main power connection, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, all nicely done. Very easy to read, very legible. So if you are putting together a PC for your first time and you're trying to assemble your modular power supply, this is very straightforward. Okay, so next up, we're gonna take a look at some of the cabling. Now, as always, all the cables come in a nice thermal take little carry case there with a little bit of Velcro on. So for the ASMR viewers, here we go. And there we go, there is our bag for the cables. And like I said, you do get your mains power cable, cable ties and some screws to attach. And then you also get two huge bundles of cabling. So let's break these down and go through them individually. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of cables here. So let's go through them. So first of all, we've got our main 24 pin power connector. Again, as always now with the ATX 3.0 standard, they don't do a 20 pin version. So they have got solid 24 pin connection there. And also nice cabling as well, nice and easy to uh, flex. Nicely done, so for cable management, all nice flat cabling, as you'd expect. Next up is gonna be the CPU or EPS connection. So this is actually really good, like they've done with other models. So if you've just got a single eight pin, there is a single molded eight pin. If you've got a split or four plus four, or you want an eight plus four or an eight plus eight, no worries, got it covered there. You can just break that connection apart and it becomes two four pins. So you can use those two individual cables so you can get all of the power through without having to piggyback. Next up, we've got our PCI Express cables, of which there are three. So if you have got a three slot card or a three port card, and it's basically 24 pins in total, you can do that very easily without having to piggyback. Or if you want to, you can use piggybacks. The choice is entirely up to you. Two of the cables have got piggybacks on them. So they are 500 mil plus 150. If you use the just the standard one, that one's 500 mil. And again, you've got another one the same there with the piggyback connector, which has the eight pin, basically splits six plus two, and that is on both sides. All nice flat cabling as well, so nice and easy to cable manage. Now clearly the star of the show, as always with these power supplies, is gonna be the 16 pin high power connection, or 12 volt high power as it's known. This is basically for mostly Nvidia cards at the moment, but I'm pretty sure it is gonna become a very mainstream thing sooner or later. I think some companies are kind of holding back a little bit because of the uh, the issues that have been happening with them. But as you've possibly seen on another video, these cables they've done really nicely. So you don't have any additional mesh covering on there. There's no cable ties or anything holding it in place. And that is where the problems are with these because they need to have a little bit of room to flex. Now, as you can see this one, you can pretty much bend right over on itself. It does flex very nicely and they've made it in a way so that the extra four pin cable isn't captive. So it is loose there. So it flexes around very nicely and can follow the contours of your PC very easily. When it comes to the length on this one, you're looking at 600 mils, which is ironic because it's also 600 watts. So now we'll look at some of the uh, the more common accessory ports. So the SATA cables, two SATA cables, four ports on each. And with these, you're looking at 550 mil to the first connection, then 150 for each additional one. So yeah, nice long cable, almost a meter long when you've got all of it laid out. Two of those are included, so up to eight SATA devices. And when it comes to the Molex connection, I know again, it's not a Molex connection, that is the brand, but people know it as that. So this is the four pin Molex or the old hard disk drive or CD-ROM connection, that sort of thing. It is still used and does actually tend to deliver more power or have more power available than SATA connections. So if you've got a device which needs it, those are included. There's actually two of those cables of which each one has got four connections on. And last but not least, for those of you that are using Thermaltake TTRGB Plus and potentially you're using their control boxes, you do have the floppy drive style connector on there, which converts the Molex to floppy drive. These are generally included with the addressable RGB hubs and controllers, etc. And maybe you even need it for maybe an old fan hub or maybe a PCI Express USB card that might be in your PC. Probably one of those things that you never need, but it's handy to have it there just in case you do. And as with all the cables, all of it is done in this really nice white cabling to match your white PSU and potentially your white build. So there you go, that pretty much wraps things up for the Thermaltake Tough Power GFA3 1050 watt power supply, gold rated PCI Express Gen 5 
ATX 3.0 compliant power supply. I think it does offer a lot of value for money there. It's going to be one of those things that as time goes on, ATX 3.0 and Gen 5 is going to become very much of a thing. And we're going to start seeing the older ATX power supplies being phased out, which I think is probably a good thing. They were designed a long time ago and they weren't really designed with today's modern PCs in mind. If you're still doing budget builds or lower power builds, then of course the older power supply is going to be absolutely fine. But I think if you're building a new PC in 2023 and going forward, it's probably worth looking at these newer power supplies. You are going to end up spending more money because it is a more expensive platform to build. And speaking of which, the OEM for this, for those of you that are interested, is a company called CE Link. Uh, they're really well known in the industry as an ODM or OEM for making power supplies, charging units, etc., etc. Very high quality components, very high quality equipment. From this, I can see it, they've done a particularly good job as they have done previously. Like I said, I'll put the prices and uh, different options in the video description so you can check out for yourselves. But for now, I've been Mike. This is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To. And hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.